dear friends, colleagues, compatriots from throughout the continent, uh, give me great pleasure to welcome you into this, the second of a four-part series leading up to the main Africa PCR event in March of 2023. In this webinar, we are entitled, How Should I Treat a Pregnant Woman with Mitral Stenosis? A Patient's Journey. We are going to be uh, tracing a patient's journey from primary care to uh, cardiology services who is pregnant with mitral stenosis in Kampala, Uganda. The objectives of this session are threefold. Um, to those of you who practice in a primary care setting, we are going to remind you how to recognize and diagnose mitral stenosis in the pregnant patient. Uh, we are going to be uh, reminding you how to optimize the medical management of a pregnant patient uh, who has mitral stenosis. And the third of our objectives is to remind all of us how to select and prepare that pregnant patient with mitral stenosis for safe mitral valvotomy in case they need it. To help us deliver on these objectives, I'm very fortunate to have with me uh, Dr. Simon Bulwa, who is our general practitioner. Um, in addition to that, we have Professor Emi Okello, based at the uh, Uganda Heart Instit Institute in Kampala, Uganda. We have Dr. Yemi Johnson in Lagos, Nigeria. And then rounding the team off, we have Dr. Daniel Iraguha, from, also from Heart Institute Uganda. My name is Mbiko Ntseche, and I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa. So I am now going to hand over to Dr. Simon Bulwa to tell us, A, about uh, the patient, and to describe really the environment in which he works. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Once again. Uh, this is Bulamu Medical Center, Namponge, Dr. Buras, Simon Peter, Medical Officer. I'm presenting KR, 32 years, female, from Chikandwa in Madrid, Catholic, uh, who is a peasant, married, who was uh, seen on 22nd November 2021. Came in with uh, presenting complaints of palpitations for six years and is a fatigability for two months. Uh, so the gravity of four, color two, plus one, with the last known menstruation period of 1st October 2021, presented with a difficulty in breathing, palpitations associated with is a fatigability, dry cough. However, there was no lower limb swelling. On the review of other systems, they were unremarkable. In obstetric history, she had uh, four pregnancies. Uh, the first one she delivered by spontaneous vertexy delivery. Uh, that was in 2012. The second one was in 2018. It was an abortion, and the cause was not clear. Uh, the third one was in 2019, where she was done, cesarean section, second to preeclampsia. The current pregnancy is the one with the last normal menstruation period of 1st October 2021, with the expected date of delivery, 8th July 2022. And the time when I saw her, which saw her menorrhea was seven weeks, three days. Our next examination, she had mild color, which had no jaundice, but with red edema. At the vasicular exam, the pulse was 82, it's per minute, blood pressure of 110.80 millimeters of mercury. She had a diastolic mama at the apex, and the apex beat was not expressed. And the respiratory exam, the respiratory rate was 16 degrees per minute, with base of preparations. So I came up with a diagnosis of a gravity of four, pala two plus one, at seven weeks, three days of amenorrhea, with features of heart failure, uh, acquiring a valvular heart disease. And my plan was to refer to Heart Institute, ECHO for ECHO ECG and the further management of the patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for uh who you sent for further evaluation at the Uganda Heart Institute. I just have a few questions that I wanted to ask um, regarding your health facility and regarding the, the patient you referred. Uh, we would like to know about your, your health facility uh, in terms of the structure. How far is it from the Uganda Heart Institute and what, what kind of unit or facility is it? 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my facility is located 30 kilometers from the Rwanda Heart Institute. Uh, it's a private facility with four rooms and we're in a rental place. And uh, on a daily, about how many uh, staff do you have uh, running the facility from where you refer this patient from? We have four staff. Okay, that's a decent number. And uh, do you happen to have, uh, do you happen to encounter a number of cardiac patients uh, that come to you through your facility? And if so, what kind of patients do you tend to get in this group? Yes, we get them. Uh, me being a general practitioner, I get all kinds of patients, not only cardiac patients, but cardiac patients, I get them, like the heart failure patients. Some of them who are receiving uh, treatment from regional file, they always come for review. And then hypertensive patients, but mainly heart failure and hypertensive. Once in a while, you can get somebody complaining of angina and the others. And okay. Okay. Hypertensive. okay. Thank you. I was wondering for these patients that you happen to get that are cardiac, uh, if you have them, do you have access to some of the investigations like uh, an ECG, echo, and chest x ray within or close to your facility? Uh, for an x ray, the closest place where we can get it is around 10 kilometers from my facility. But for the ECG and the echo, I mainly send them to the and heart institute. That's the target kilometers for my place. Okay, thank you. Uh, about our patient that you referred, uh, at the time of, of, of your interaction with her, uh, what were you suspecting her to have and uh, what prompted you to, to do the referral um, to us? Okay, when she came to me, so actually she had come for antenatal this but also she complained of uh, palpitations and uh, difficulty in breathing. So I had to go to dig and see exactly what is the cause of the palpitations. That's when I found she was had a fatigability and then uh, difficulty in breathing. So, um, the examination, that's when I found uh, a nystalk mama on the apex. So there I suspected it to be with those features of heart failure, of the is a fatigability and then Difficult in breathing and the presence of mama, I suspected to be with a valvular heart condition. That's why I referred for further evaluation. So, Peter, when you happened to first interface with the patient you referred, did you suspect that she could be having mitral valve stenosis? Mm, yes, I suspected it because from my examination, she was having a mama at the apex and uh, being in an environment where we have commonly heart diseases, so I was highly suspicious of the stenosis. Okay. And then in terms of uh, management for this patient and some of the patients that you happen to interface with that have cardiac conditions, do you have uh, an option of medication that you can offer them? Um, and if so, what kind of medications do you have? Yes, being a private a private uh, clinic, normally buy our medications, but uh, we have diuretics uh, like the furosemide, spironolactone. We have the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, the capitopils, and then we have the beta blockers. Uh, was the patient uh, you referred? Uh, did you happen to offer some of these medications, given your suspicions? No. I didn't offer any medication because by the time she appeared to me, she was able to move properly. She didn't have a edema, by repeating edema. So I said, let me first send for the specialist for proper evaluation before we started the medication. Okay, thank you. Uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Iraguha Daniel. Uh, cardiology fellow at the Uganda Heart Institute. And I'm going to be giving a presentation on the patient's journey through our health facility, particularly related to how to treat a pregnant woman with mitral stenosis.
And this was our initial echo at the time of evaluation. And uh, what we have here is uh, our parastanal long axis view. Uh, what we see is the left atrium, the left ventricle, the LVOT, and the right ventricle. But of keen interest here, we have a dilated left atrium with a thickening of the mitral valve leaflets with restricted movement or motion of these leaflets. On color Doppler interrogation at the mitral valve, we see turbulence uh, across the mitral valve with a regurgitant lesion, mitral, mitral regurgitation, but this is mild. For the M mod that was done with the left ventricle, she had a good LV systolic function with normal sized left ventricle. And on the uh, parastinal short axis view, what we see on the mitral valve is thickened mitral valve leaflets with uh, restricted movement. And then there seems to be fusion of the commissures of the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. The apical four chamber view. Um, what is of keen interest here, we definitely have our dilated left atrium with restricted uh, opening of the mitral valve leaflets and accompanied thickening of our, our leaflets on this particular patient. Uh, doing color Doppler interrogation of the mitral valve and recastrate valve, what stands out is turbulence, as you can see in the apical four chamber. Uh, with mild mitral regurgitation, suggesting that this patient is having features of mitral stenosis, uh, an obstructive lesion across the mitral valve with mild regurgitation. Here on the color envelope, you can see the, some small trace of, of tricuspid regurgitation. And um, proceeding in our evaluation, we went ahead to try to slice the mitral valve area and she had severe mitral valve stenosis uh, of about 0 0.6, which is quite tight and possibly explaining some of the symptoms that she presented with heart failure. Uh, we had about the same size estimation on pressure half time uh, for these patients, so you'd prefer to have uh, uh, mitral valve area assessment by planimetry. When we did to the pressure gradient across the valve, it was extremely elevated. We had a, a mean pressure gradient of about 25 millimeters of mercury. And because they have these obstructive lesions, they tend to get pulmonary hypertension. We did uh, assess at the tricuspid valve and we had a TRPG of about uh, 37 millimeters of mercury. Wow, um, you must admit, uh, Dr. Johnson, that uh, this patient was very fortunate to have met uh, Dr. Bulwa. It seems like the folks in Uganda, even in a primary care setting, uh, really trained their doctors well to be able to recognize uh, this condition. Tell us a little bit about um, a primary care clinic in uh, Lagos um, or Abuja and what uh, a patient like this, how they would have been diagnosed and, and treated. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, well, it depends on where. Um, if it's in the city, Lagos, Abuja, any of the big cities, Port Harcourt, or if it's in the remote, more remote areas where um, access to healthcare is uh, a bit difficult. Now, in the city, what most primary care doctors would do generally, this kind of patient where you hear a murmur, she complains of palpitations, there are several choices. Uh, what many of us would do, we would refer to a cardiologist or there are many diagnostic centers now in the city. So you just send to one of the diagnostic centers and then they will do the ECG and do the echo. And once you get that, you see the results, then we tend not to treat ourselves. The primary care doctors would not treat themselves, but we would send to a cardiologist and it probably a cardiologist in the general hospital, in the teaching hospital, or in private practice, but more generally, more usually in the uh, general hospital. And then the cardiologist would take it from there. Now in the rural setting, it is a lot more complicated, a lot more complicated because 
First of all, most patients do not go to primary health care centers for antenatal care. So it's done at home, it's done by traditional birthers. So these symptoms will not be picked up early. They will be picked up when the patient is in trouble. And uh, that's what tends to happen. And unfortunately, I was looking at statistics just this morning. Uh, most do not get to childbearing age. So this problem is not picked up early in, this, in the uh, villages. It really isn't. So this patient would not have done well in the rural setting. So Timmy, can I rely on you? Okay, so um, Dr. Johnson, uh, thanks for that. Um, with regard to uh, facilities for diagnosis, let's come back to the urban setting. Uh, right. There are things we heard from Dr. Bulwa, what's available with regard to things like ECGs and uh, chest x-ray. Um, would such be available in a primary care setting in uh, Abuja or Lagos? Primary care, it, well, in the average primary care, no. Uh, in the private clinics, yes. Most primary care facilities do not even have ECG, not talk about X-ray. They don't. So they will send out to get those things done. They're definitely an ECG. Even some cardiologists don't have ECGs in their office. So they will send them out. But there are diagnostic centers all over the place. So they will send them to a diagnostic center to get ECG done and to get the uh, echo done. Okay. But the average then, person won't have access to that. Okay. And once they go to this diagnostic center and uh, they get some information back that uh, suggests mitral stenosis, what, what medication would the doctors uh, have available to them? Well, we heard that in Kampala, at least they have some uh, Lasix and perhaps beta blocker. What, what medication would you have available to you? Uh, Lasix is available everywhere. Lasix is available uh -huh. everywhere. Once you get to a doctor, you'll be able to get Lasix. Uh, but it might take some time. You know, if you're in a rural setting, they'll ask you to get some Lasix. Then you have to drive or find a way to get about 20 miles away from where you are to get a drugstore to get Lasix. But it will be available, but not readily available in the doctor's office, no. But in Abuja, in Lagos, in the urban centers, Lasix is available everywhere. Very easily available. Beta blockers as well. Most common beta blocker we have is uh, Atenolol. Okay, wonderful. So, you, yes. Yes. so usually most of us will start on Lasix and Atenolol. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Daniel, um, are there questions in the chat that you'd like to um, bring up? Uh, yes. What's happening in the chat? Yeah, we, there was just, there's just a comment that was coming in from Helmi, uh, just inquiring about the mitral valve area and the pulmonary pressures, but I think that has uh, been addressed. And uh, he's also trying to give a comment about the use of beta blockers and diuretics uh, to, in the management uh, of patients. Uh, but I think this is also going to be coming up soon in the subsequent parts of our discussions. Uh, so those are some of the comments that are coming in so far. All right. Um, Emmy, this patient, um, if you were advising Dr. Bulwa, would you have advised him perhaps to, since the question has just come up about beta blockers and Lasix, um, uh, are you happy with that Dr. Bulwa, in a sense, sent the patient on without starting medication? Would you advise that maybe he starts medication or what kind of things would you think about or what kind of patients would you suggest that uh, Lasix and beta blockers start, get started on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, given the fact that the patient was symptomatic when she went over to him, uh, you know, and, you know, we have just revised this in our national uh, clinical guidelines. So at uh, Simon's health facility, he would have had uh, access to uh, a beta blocker and frisamide, which, uh, yes, I would advise that he should have started that on medication, uh, started her on that medication. And most times, uh, you know, uh, most patients wouldn't have the opportunity to come to the Heart Institute. If she was started on this too and she did well, she, she you know, could have 
progressed well and then maybe later on if she developed uh, more severe symptoms then should have come in. Just as a reminder, the Ugandan health system has about six levels. So in terms of cardiac care, the heart institute would be at the sixth level at the top. And so you have the different levels uh, through which this patient would have been referred and she would have access to care uh, you know, at any of those facilities. Okay. Uh, Yemi, if you had uh, the opportunity over again and this patient had presented, um, would you have advised early treatment um, to be initiated at that, at that center? Uh, that's not the easiest question to answer. Um, it all depends on, I always recommend the primary care doctor does what they feel comfortable doing. And uh, if they feel it's easier to just refer out, I'd, I think that's fine, just refer out, uh, rather than keep the patient and uh, you know, you might have the right diagnosis, you might not have. So I think it's safer to just refer out. Our healthcare system is not that well structured. So um, it's, I think it's easier for people to just refer out and uh, rather than start to treat themselves. Right. You, you mentioned that there are diagnostic uh, centers. I think you call them diagnostic centers before the patient yes. gets to the cardiologist. What, what, yes. what, what exactly do they offer? Do they have echo there? Do they have ultrasound? Do they have uh, ECGs? What do these diagnostic centers have? Everything. That's the beauty of what's going on in uh, Nigeria now. Uh, all the tests, MRI, CT scans, echoes, ECGs, they're all there. Stress tests, they have most of them. Most of the diagnostic centers have all of these things. So which has actually helped a lot in treatment in the urban areas. In rural areas, it's still is still the same uh, lack of access. Okay. And then um, before we move on to discussing uh, what happened when the patient uh, arrived at the diagnostic center, I'm going to do two things. One, Daniel, anything, any additional questions coming through in the chat or comments? Yeah. Yes, there are some questions coming in, but I think I don't want to preempt so much of the the discussion as of now. They'll be later for our, the last bits of the management. There's just one interesting question um, that uh, one that has come in on WhatsApp, and uh, one of the members is asking, "What is the burden of rheumatic heart disease among pregnant women in Uganda?" I don't know if there's a comment on that. Yeah, can I answer Emma, that? You want to tackle that? Yeah. Yeah. So we did a study three years ago uh, in two districts in central Uganda, and we followed up and screened some 3,500. Uh, women attending at natural care and the, the, the prevalence of uh, heart disease among them was, you know, 20% and 18% of that or 80% or of those had rheumatic heart disease. So uh, pretty high. This is just two natural centers. Right. Uh, Yemi, do you have similar uh, information? Is it high? Is it low? Uh, even if you don't have the exact numbers, what's your impression? Well, that's uh, something that's a bit surprising. The incidence of rheumatic heart disease is quite low lately. We have data from many years back, which showed uh, it was still lower than most of Africa. And uh, we think it's because of the, should I use the word, indiscriminate use of antibiotics. Uh, everywhere there's antibiotics. You get antibiotics from a from a witch doctor, from a herbalist. So everybody takes antibiotics and anti-malaria for anything that's wrong. So the incidence is very low. I actually went around and talked to the people who wrote the papers and they say, right now, even in the rural areas, they find very low incidence of rheumatic heart disease. 15, 20 years ago, it was high, but right now it's very low. Okay, brilliant. Um, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, so let's move on then. This patient, uh, as we heard from Dr. Bulwa, was referred on to uh, a, the Uganda Heart Institute. Um, Yemi, if this patient had been referred to your center, you uh, saw, you've heard the story. She's got quite severe mitral stenosis. You've seen the echocardiogram. Um, would you like to tell us uh, how this patient would be treated at your facility? 
Uh, yes. Um, well, first of all, um, maybe you, of course, optimize it medically. Uh, well, well, first of all, we get the echo, look at the echo, and um, confirm the diagnosis. And um, of course, we start with diuretics, beta blockers, optimize medical treatment, and then go through definitive treatment options. And one of one of which would be a balloon mitovaloplasty. Now. I can say there are about three of us trained to do this procedure, but in the past 10 years, we haven't had any cases. We haven't had any cases. So it would be quite an interesting situation for us, uh, but we would uh, probably go through the procedures, call one of you guys who's uh, done it more frequently to come help us assist and uh, go ahead and do the procedure. But right now, we don't, find cases to do. Most of our mitral valve uh, rheumatic heart disease are mixed stenosis and um, stenosis and uh, regurgitation. So right now we don't have the experience. We're, we're theoretical okay. balloon my uh, valvuloplasty people. Right, right, right. Um, so you, you say the last one you did was uh, about 10 years ago then? 10 years ago. Okay, so it's um, it's been a while. Um, yeah. <clears throat> perhaps that we can just review uh, the from pretend the patient has been there ten years ago, and you were going to go ahead and do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. Um, can you share with us, uh, just in terms of that echo assessment, what do you use the Wilkins score to decide? Or did you, when you were doing them more frequently, what was the, the sort of scoring system that you used to uh, determine, uh, you know, whether or not you, you thought it was a suitable valve? Well, uh, yes, we did. And, would, you know, uh, basically, we'd use the score, assess and see uh, if this was uh, a suitable case. And uh, this one, it, it looks, it looks uh, suitable looking at it. I didn't have time to really look at the echo because I was trying to set up my screen. I came a bit late, but yes, we'd use a score and, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is the degree of calcification is the most important um, variable there. Right. Okay. Um, then in terms of uh, the actual procedure, um, you, Used the Anui technique. What 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 was your sort of preferred uh, technique of choice? It was the Anui technique because I I learned my procedures under somebody who learned under Anui Japanese guy when I was in the US. So yes, definitely Anui technique. Okay. okay. Now the details of which okay. I cannot the step by step I can't go through right now. No. Right, 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 right. So it's really about um, you know preparing. Any comments on, for example, the timing? So this patient was eight weeks. Any comments about the timing of when you might consider doing the PTMC? I want to do it eight weeks, first trimester, second. You want to do it before the hemodynamic problem starts, which is usually in the second trimester. So... Uh, Eight weeks is still in the first trimester. I think I would want to do it before 12 weeks because uh, the hemodynamic uh, changes usually occur in the uh, second trimester. Right, right. right. Okay. Um, perhaps we can then uh, switch over to find out uh, what the guys in Kampala actually did uh, before we take uh, some more questions. Um, can we find out what the, our team in Kampala actually did with this patient? What did we do for our patient when we did this evaluation and uh, wanted to manage her? So from that echo, we had uh, a gravid uh, four para two plus one, a mother at eight weeks of amenorrhea with a new diagnosis of rheumatic heart disease, severe mitral valve stenosis and mild mitral regurgitation, having more irregular pulmonary hypertension. So in heart failure, so we did initiate her on anti- failure treatment, for which we opted for diuretics, uh, where we gave her 
um, all of furosemide for terminal glomus once a day and uh, initiated her as well as, as, well as uh, oral atenolone, small dose of about 25 milligrams or D2, help slow down the, the heart rate and allow for adequate feeling of the LV. Uh, also, this would, in a way, help reduce her symptoms of heart failure. She was also initiated on benzathine penicillin to help prevent progression of the disease and help with any protection from recurrent acute rheumatic fever attacks. So at that time, we also, in addition to letting her know her current condition, we, we told her of the option of balloon mitral valvotomy, but because she was still early in pregnancy, uh, and because of the radiation that they usually tend to get exposed to during the procedure, we opted that this would come on board later in her pregnancy, possibly around after 20 weeks of, of gestation. Uh, and more so, if we were able to control her symptoms on the medication, we were buying ourselves some time. So she eventually came back to us uh, much later in her pregnancy at about five, five and a half months because she was still having these symptoms. And because of this, we did uh, offer her the option of the balloon mitral valvotomy, given that now it was safer for her to do it and would not be exposing the fetus to radiation and uh, fetal abnormalities that would come about from, from this radiation exposure. So what we have here on this slide is our patient, of course, line, line super, and this is an AP view. And uh, we have access, what you see in the, is a pigtail uh, catheter that has been delivered into the LV from the descending iota up towards the LV. So it's more of like a reference, it helps guide during the process, the process of the interatrial here that was done to deliver our, uh, this wire, this guy, this wire is located in the left atrium. So the process is usually staged and you have access uh, on the left and right femoral. And having delivered your access to the left, uh, the femoral artery and the femoral, femoral vein, allowing uh, permission to, to go ahead and do intra-atrial puncture, then once that is done, you're able to proceed to, to deliver the new balloon, what we see here as we wait for the balloon to inflate. So this balloon is, is across the mitral valve, and what usually happens is you have distal inflation first, and then the proximal balloon then goes ahead to to do, to Get distended, and while while it while this process goes on, you're able to split the commercial fusion of the mitral valve. And once this is done, it, it in a way helps reduce on the left atrial pressures. And these are a summary of what we noted on the echo in comparison to where she was initially. So, if you ask me, I think the patient did have a successful procedure. And uh, when we did do follow-up of our patient, she, of course, good thing, she did not sustain any complications post-procedure. Among the complications that they could get, um, the common one that will occur immediately is severe mitral regurgitation. Um, then um, you could also have things like uh, a pericardial effusion, you could have an ASD created during the interatrial puncture. Uh, to mention but a few. Um, some of these complications are avoided by doing uh, proper pre-BMV echo assessment where you want to do a Wilkins assessment of the mitral valve and preferably if, prefer that they can get a BMV if the Wilkins score is about seven and, and below. If it goes above that, then you start fearing complications that would arise because they, if they have calcified mitral valves, they tend to have the risk of developing severe mitral regurgitation. So she was with us uh, just for two days after the procedure with minimal symptoms and discharged on medication. And then when we did subsequent follow-up, she had to attend her antenatal care 
she then subsequently had a good uh, successful delivery at the time the team that saw her at uh, the women's hospital where she delivered from they decided to do a cesarean section uh, to deliver a baby boy that is what i had to present uh, for the patient that came through our facility thank you for listening Oh, wonderful. Thanks, uh, Daniel. That's a nice illustration. And uh, it's always nice when the patient's uh, story ends well. Uh, nice that they were able to deliver a nice, healthy baby boy. Despite the, those were quite uh, remarkable hemodynamics with a mean gradient of 25. Um, are there any additional questions in the um, chat, Daniel, that we need to take on? I've got a number of questions for both uh, our panel members, but let's uh, take what's in the in the in the uh, chat first. Yes, we do have a number of questions coming in from the chat. In, in the chat, uh, we we have an interesting question uh, coming in from KD. I think from Nigeria, he's uh, he's wanting he wants to know about the issue of anticoagulation in uh, in these particular patients. Is there a role for anticoagulation? Um, there are some others coming in. I don't know if I could uh, get to read all of them and then you could yes, address them. Yes, tell us the question. Go ahead and tell us the questions and then we'll uh, tackle them as, go ahead and list them. Okay, then there's uh, another question coming in from Uganda from uh, uh, Happy Mbabazi. She's asking what's the preferred beta blocker uh, that would offer for, for pregnant women, uh, given that there's some um, a class C, um, regarding some of these medications. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, they were wondering about uh, what is the magnitude of mitral regurgitation that you would not uh, consider undergoing uh, balloon mitral valvotomy. Uh, we actually have a busy chat this evening. Um, um, because one of them was from Helmi asking still the same if you would undergo balloon EMV when with moderate mitral regurgitation. Um, okay. Why don't we take those 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 four questions and we'll come back and address some of the other questions. That's fantastic that uh, our audience is so engaged. Um, uh, Emmy, can I start with you? Uh, find out in 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 Kampala and Uganda what your approach to anticoagulation is under the circumstances. Yeah, so this uh, patient was in sinus rhythm. So normally out of the cath lab, she wouldn't be uh, anticoagulated. But uh, in the cath lab, as part of the PMV procedure, uh, she would receive uh, unfractionated heparin. Half of that, uh, by the guidelines, is given uh, before the transept of puncture. And the other half is given usually at you know a rate of 70 units per kg. Uh, so we'll give half before and half after uh, and, you know, we then monitor INR and usually the procedure doesn't take so long that you need to give an additional dose. It's it's a, a one-time right. before and after the transept. Okay. Yami, I uh, understand that it's been a while since uh, uh, it sounds like anybody's had to do PTMC and think, but do you routinely exclude clot from the left atrial appendage in these patients prior to B BMV? Um, if we have a TEE, yes, definitely. We would uh, look at the okay. atrial appendage and see. Uh, but, you know, in pre yes, we would look into the left atrial appendage, which we have TEE here, but um, some patients don't have the TEE and they, they would just go ahead and do it. But uh, just we have TEE, so okay. we would we'll check. Right. And Emmy, what is your practice? Do you uh, routinely exclude TEE um, uh, with a TEE left atrial appendage or do you just proceed? Only if, um, uh, if they have history of atrial fibrillation. If they've come in and they have only if they're in the atrial fibrillation. Yes, then we bridge them. That's you know, different. Wafering. Yeah. Uh, not routinely. I must say, right. Our practice here is to look beforehand. Um, some of it is is having had uh, unpleasant experience in the early days of us doing this, so we routinely look, but it's an interesting one. And then, um, Yemi, if the patient 
had been in atrial fibrillation, I think, which is one of the things that the uh, our audience member was getting at. Um, what 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 is the, the approach to anticoagulation with your obstetricians? Do you use warfarin? Do you admit them for IV heparin for till till much later? What, what's your what's your approach to anticoagulation with these patients? Heparin. Heparin. Uh, nobody would use warfarin, I don't think. So heparin. Even though some data okay. says third trimester, we wouldn't use warfarin. Heparin all the way. So you. you 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 admit them for the entire no 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 no. So no you no you give subcut heparin and uh, okay that's sort of a halfway right. uh, thing no you you won't admit no just give subcut heparin and they self inject self administer okay um, uh, what happens in Uganda something it's a a mix of things uh, the ideal uh, and we advise this to most people. You know, when they conceive and they need to be anticoagulated, then subcutaneous, uh, you know, uh, heparin, and you know, Uh But there are a few cases that we have co-managed with the obstetricians where, you know, they do heparin in the first uh, trimester, then the second trimester, then warfarin, and then in the third trimester, they go back to heparin. Okay. All right. Yeah, this is a, sort of a controversial issue. Obviously, um, we do a little uh, much of what you just described in the latter, where uh, you know many patients obviously present uh, quite late um, and not quite in that first trimester. But we would cover with heparin in that first trimester, or subcut uh, enoxaparin or something like that, and then warfarin, and then later on change things as as required. Um, the next issue that came up uh, before we get to the one about mitral regurgitation was uh, the use of uh, beta blockers in pregnancy and whether uh, some are, so there are two things I suppose that are at issue. Are there beta blockers that are better for the mitral stenosis and are there beta blockers that are less teratogenic? Uh, the audience member talked about a class C uh, uh, agent, what 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 do you use in Nigeria? What would you use in Nigeria, Yemi? Atenolol. Atenolol is what is usually used. Yes. Okay. Is that because of a specific indication, because of its benefits, or is that just what's uh, available on the market? No, I think that's no. All the beta blockers are available, but that's the only one that has some has been studied a little bit in pregnancy. All the others right. don't have much data. Okay. And the same is true in Kampala or Uganda. What do you do, uh, uh, Emi? Yeah, uh, most times we go for atenolol. Uh, we stay away from the other beta blockers because of their stronger effect on the blood pressure. You know, in patients like this, the blood pressure is usually on the lower side. So most patients tolerate at atenolol better, you know, to control the rate together with the diuretic. Yeah, the issue of, you know, being... Uh, uh, you know, grade C in terms of obstetric risk is there, uh, but most times you don't have an option. Right, 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 right. No, very, very, very important point. So, um, in a way, I guess this uh, to tackle the uh, third question that came in. Uh, it's really about that. Uh, you know, we said we wanted to make sure we understood uh, how to perform and prepare our patient for safe uh, PTMC for going to do that. In terms of the echo evaluation, uh, Yemi, this patient uh, what, that Daniel had shown us that the patient had what looked like uh, one or two plus mitral regurgitation. How do you integrate that into your decision making about PTMC? How does one do that? Uh, well, mitral regurgitation is always uh, an issue. Um, once it's, it gets what grade you use, one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus. If everybody agrees it's more than two plus, they're probably not the thing to do. Uh, but you know, these things can sometimes be subjective. Depends on how, how, uh, how determined you are to do this procedure or not. And you, you weigh the risks and, uh, okay, what happens? Right. You do somebody with moderate MR, you balloon it, it becomes severe. It's still easier to treat in the meantime than uh, severe mitral stenosis. So it all depends on what you have available. But generally, anything above 2 plus... We wouldn't, we wouldn't recommend it. Right. 
would you would you have been comfortable to do PTMC in this patient with the mitral regurgitation that we saw? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Daniel. Okay, great. Uh, Emmy, you want to walk us through your thinking in this patient? You 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 weren't phased by the mitral regurgitation. No, because uh, it looked like a, a one plus one plus two. Uh, you know, classified generally as a mild mitral regurgitation. We tend to stay away if it's a moderate mitral regurgitation, moderate severe, uh, unless you have no other option. But if you have you know, an option to still treat this patient medically, they're not in a terrible heart failure, they're not in your three and four, you will, you know, go uh, medical. But yes, uh, in this patient, we thought she had mild mitral regurgitation. Uh, she didn't have commissural uh, calcification. Uh, the Wilkins score was favorable. And so we predicted that the procedure would be safe. And uh, indeed, it was safe. But I just want to add uh, that, of course, as we make that decision, we have a hard team that would have discussed this and there are a number of things that we have in place. We have an anesthesiologist in the room when we do the procedure. We have cardiac surgery two meters away. Uh, if you know she develops severe mitral agitation, we move across. We did the procedure at 22 weeks of amenorrhea, meaning that if she crossed over to surgery, the baby would likely survive in an incubator. And then, of course, we use uh, conscious sedation. We don't, we don't uh, do... GA and we don't do TE intra op anymore. We do trans uh, And of course, we protected the patient uh, and the baby uh, from radiation through a number of ways, you know, reducing the frame rate to 10 uh, instead of the 15 and 30 that we use routinely uh, by wrapping her tummy, making sure that the back was covered and so that keeping her away from radiation. And the exposure time, the total exposure time, I think, was about five minutes, usually the lower the exposure time, the better. So there are a number of things that we did to make sure that uh, it was a safe a safe PMV for the patient and the baby. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, Daniel, um, what are the questions looking like there? So we do, we do have some more questions coming in. Uh, there was a, call, a question from Justine from Uganda uh, asking for a comment on precautions that uh, we could undertake for safety of the fetus uh, during the, the procedure. Then we do have uh, another question coming in from Zhang uh, asking for a comment on the mode of delivery uh, for these patients with uh, severe mitral stenosis post-balloon. Um, then uh, there was a comment from one of the, one of the uh, persons, Muhammad, who's asking about uh, anticoagulation role of warfarin the patient with AFI, but I think this was a bit, this was tackled uh, during the discussion, but would add on just to answer his question. Okay, lovely. Um, great. So, Emmy, I, I must admit, uh, I think it would be very useful to, you, you went through some of the precautions that you took, uh, particularly around protection of the fetus. Uh, I should Maybe I should use your surnames because when I say Emmy and Yemi, uh, <laughs> I can see that uh, the, the, the both of your ears are going up. So I better use your surname <laughs> so that it, uh, <laughs> it's clear as to who we're talking about. So, uh, uh, Dr. Okello, you um, sort of quickly went through some of the precautions that uh, you took to try and make this procedure safe for the baby. Um, let me st uh, start by asking you to repeat what, what it is that you had uh, summarized. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, the principle is that you're reducing radiation exposure to the baby, uh, which is measured in, in a unit called the, you know, the micro gray or grays. The lower the gray, the better. Usually you want exposure less than 50 micro gray. More than that, the risk of uh, you know, uh, the effect of the baby, including uh, microcephaly, mental retardation, growth retardation, will increase. And, uh, and, and these effects happen through what is called deterministic and stochastic. These are just uh, deterministic means that the radiation effects on the baby based on the amount of uh, radiation exposure. You can actually calculate the dose. Stochastic is sort of, uh, it doesn't matter how much, how much exposure happened to the baby, but it will be unpredictable. So these are important. So, so then we then do a number of procedures 
to protect the patient. Then another patient that's coming through the cath lab, especially here you have a, a woman who is pregnant with a 22-week pregnancy. So uh, number one, you make sure that she is, uh, a, you know, you wrap her with a lead gown, you wrap the pelvis and the abdomen, the lead gown. Remember the radiation is coming from below the table, so especially the back of the patient should be wrapped to keep away the radiation, that's number one. Number two is that we then use a low frame rates. Frame rates is the, amount, is, is the rate at which the, you know, uh, the extra energy is released as you step on the foot pedal in the cath lab. And normally we have between 15 and 30. Uh, you know, this, is, this gives you a very clear image, but comes at a high radiation cost. So you want to make sure that you reduce the radiation. And whenever we work in pregnant women, we use about 7.5 to 10. And then the exposure itself, you don't step on the foot pedal and chat to your colleague. You want, you want to go in, out, step, <laughs> do whatever you need to do, and then get up. So that eventually, when you calculate the amount of time that the patient is exposed to radiation should be, if, if it's less than five minutes total, well and good. Uh, yes, and then uh, we use what's called a floral save. As you saw the picture, we didn't take uh, sign images, which are clear, nice video images we use, for example, when you're doing a PCI, we're using sort of the low energy uh, floral images. All this uh, done to make sure that the radiation exposure uh, to the baby is uh, markedly re reduced. Yes. And then, of course, there's monitoring, hemodynamic, uh, dynamic monitoring. Remember, there's very microstenosis. So even when we went to balloon uh, the valve, you want to do it quickly so that you don't, you know, uh, further worsen the hemodynamics, the heavy pressure. Thank Wonderful. You. I mean, uh, something in addition is, is around the timing of the PTMC. I mean, uh, how does that affect, uh, potentially affect the fetus? I know that uh, Dr. Jensen had said, if the patient was very symptomatic, um, he may consider going in around 10, 12 weeks. Um, is there a difference between going in at 10, 12 weeks versus 22 weeks with regard to fe fetal safety? Yes, uh, so uh, the older the baby, the better. Number one is the amount of uh, radiation, if ever, if the radiation got to the baby, the survivor and these effects that I was talking about, because the older fetus will handle that better, number one. Number two, if you got a complication in the cath lab and you needed to go for cardiac surgery, uh, the baby that's you know 22 weeks and above will usually do better and they can go through an incubator as opposed to an eight week or 12 week uh, sort of uh, a baby. Uh, and then uh, number three, of course, addressing what Dr. Yemi is talking about, as the you know as the hemodynamics of pregnancy come into and start affecting the mitral stenosis, uh, you know you want to handle this, but still highly recommended that you do from the twentieth week onwards. So if you can do between, actually most literatures uh, recommend twenty to twenty nine weeks. Okay, brilliant, um, Yemi. I, I imagine it's been a long time since uh, you delivered a baby yourself. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to hand over to you to tell us about uh, what, what, what for patients either with mitral stenosis that haven't gone undergone uh, balloon valvotomy or in a patient like this that has uh, been fortunate enough to receive it. What is the preferred mode of delivery? for a patient with mitral, pregnant patient with mitral stenosis in, in Nigeria? Um, <laughs> it depends on where and all that okay. sort of thing. Okay. But ideally, I think my understanding is um, the mode of delivery should be vaginal as much as possible. And uh, as long as you're able to make the patient stable. And uh, you do you use the uh, cesarean section for obstetric uh, indications. But for, from a cardiac standpoint, I would recommend uh, vaginal delivery, unless of course things aren't going smoothly. Then you go to cesarean section. Okay. Assuming um, you've got everything under control. Right. Uh, what's the practice in in in, in uh, Kampala or Uganda? Yeah, it's the same thing here. Uh, so we've had maybe two or three emergency BMVs where patients come in pulmonary edema and, you know, we're able to do the BMV. And once they settle and they've gone on to have vaginal deliveries, 
I think this particular patient uh, underwent caesarean section because of her poor obstetric history. The obstetricians made that decision. It wasn't really based on, on you know, her cardiac condition because she was out of heart failure and, you know, uh, right. she did well. But, yeah. I suppose the truth is in this patient after the BMV, I mean, the valve area is well above two. The gradient had come down to very acceptable levels. So, you know, uh, vaginal delivery would be uh, ideal. I must say um, in our environment, our anesthetists tend to feel like they're much more in control of, var you know, variables. Uh, clinical variables and other potential complications if they do this under uh, cesarean section. So for those patients that haven't had the PTMC, that's sort of the preferred uh, mode of treatment rather than waiting for them to get into trouble. But, you know, it, 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 uh, I do note that it varies quite a bit depending on where you are and uh, what facilities you have. Um, and before I guess ask Daniel about uh, additional questions, and um, I do want to bring up, so the decision here uh, from both of you was that given that she had severe mitral stenosis, given that she had symptoms, uh, that you would elect to do PTMC. What I want to find out from you is, would there be a role for medical management? In other words, uh, you know, you have access to, it's not much, but Lasix, beta blocker. If the patient's heart rate came down quite nicely, you repeated the echo, the uh, uh, gradient came down commensurately. You know, you can reduce the gradient quite a bit by slowing the heart rate down uh, and the patient uh, symptoms abated. Um, is there a role for sort of optimizing medical treatment and trying to carry the patient through uh, the pregnancy without PTMC here? Um, can I start with you, Yemi? Oh, yes, certainly. Um, if you can get things stable with uh, medical therapy, I think I would, I would uh, do everything I could to go through uh, delivery on medications without doing a procedure because no matter how easy the procedure is, there's always a chance of a complication. So if it is possible, patient is stable, hemodynamically stable, they will generally tend to be able to go to the uh, delivery without too much trouble. Okay. Emmy, um, any, any, any role for medical treatment in your environment? Or you are, uh, this is a collection of interventional cardiologists, so... No. <laughs> often, uh... <laughs> no, 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 I mean, this is... Uh... The, the guidelines do recommend that, you know, we really go for medical treatment first. And uh, this option was uh, given to this patient. Remember, she came to us at eight weeks and we monitored her and placed her on oral medication for a while until 22 weeks, except in her case, she wasn't over time. If she had stabilized and, you know, stayed in that state, we'd have been happy to keep her as the many others who are on medical treatment. But in, in this particular case, the, you know, patient really wasn't and, you saw her echo gradient is, is worsened, and then the, the systolic pulmonary artery pressure was high, mitral valve area was tight, and she remained in New York 3. So she really met the criteria for uh, PTMC. And we're happy she did well. Right. Okay, great. Like I said earlier, it was all's well that ends well. She delivered a nice, uh, happy baby boy. So congratulations to you and your team. I think this has been a, a really very instructive hour. I want to thank everybody. Um, we've taken this patient who presented at eight weeks. It was her fourth pregnancy. Um, I think Dr. Bulwa should be congratulated for A, tuning in to the symptoms, which he said alerted him to the possibility of heart disease. Um, clearly in Uganda, you still know how to use your stethoscopes well. And, uh, and your doctors not to use your stethoscopes. Again, you should be congratulated because he heard that uh, um, mid-diastolic rumble that gave him high suspicion of mitral stenosis. Um, you know, he quite nicely talked through uh, whether or not uh, Lasix, he said he didn't use Lasix because the patient wasn't edematous. I think that's an important variable. He didn't see the venous pressure being elevated. And he didn't want to start beta blocker because he felt that he wanted a diagnostic certainty before he did that. And I think Yemi told us in Nigeria, it'd be pretty much the same thing. The preferred uh, 
approach would be to, you know, uh, transfer the patient to a, a facility with, where they could do, uh, do more diagnostically before arriving at a diagnosis. Unfortunate. Uh, so there are two things. One, it was interesting to see that the epidemiology of disease seen, and the burden seems to be very different from east to west and east where it's still quite high and in west uh, where Yemi says, you know, cases are few and far between. So, um, and then of course we learned that uh, having started our patient on appropriate treatment, there's a place for monitoring the patient, which you guys did quite nicely. But then she presented again at 24 weeks, quite symptomatic. Um, and you decided to do a BMV, which you did brilliantly with very nice results. We talked about the echo evaluation to identify the suitable patient. We talked about anticoagulation, patients in whom you would give anticoagulation, patients in whom you wouldn't. We talked quite nicely about um, radiation safety for both mom and fetus under the circumstances and the ability to deliver your therapy in a safe, uh, effective manner. So. Uh, congratulations, team. I think uh, we, we actually did quite a, quite, quite a good job. Having uh, said that, I think um, it's now uh, time to let you know that following this uh, webinar, there will be two others. Uh, the third webinar in our series is looking at how should I treat a patient with chest pain and dyspnea from our colleagues in Mauritania and Tunisia? That's going to be on Tuesday, the 18th of October at 8 o'clock Central African time. And then the fourth in the series will be uh, two days later on the 20th of October, looking at how I should treat a patient uh, who requires pacing. And that will be from our colleagues' combined effort from Egypt and, and uh, Kenya, with a very similar format to what we have done today. So again, I'd like to really take time out to say thanks to everybody. Thanks for the audience participation. We received some uh, fantastic uh, questions, allowed us to really explore these issues in a lot of depth. So thanks for taking time out to join us today. Fantastic. Thank you.